nice showing here tonight. Uh, Lex Media is taping this tonight, so I hope everybody that does come up here is, uh, can be heard. <laughs> okay. Um, as I said, it's been an interesting two years um, as president of the society, to say the least. Um, but a fruitful one in many ways, uh, despite COVID and our inability to meet in person. Um, I started my tenure two years ago with one executive director, and I ended up with another. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put my reading glasses on here so I can see what I'm reading. There we go. Uh, despite the restrictions imposed on the society, I am happy to say we are stronger, healthier, and have a stronger vision for the society to take us to the next level. Sorry. Oh, is that on? Yeah. yeah let me take this off. Okay. Taking over already. Yeah. <laughs> she can't wait. She can't wait. I, you know, I got the gavel over there. <laughs> And we are, we are stronger, and uh, as you've all probably seen, we are really taking the society to the next level. Uh, we learned a lot about virtual programming, which we'll continue to build on in the future. Uh, programs such as the 400 Years in 40 Minutes, thanks to Marsha Baker and Harry Fosdick. Our Women in History programming and our Black Lives presentation, as well as many others, were a tribute to the creativity, the ingenuity of the staff, and board members alike. The Society's continual outreach to other organizations in town in partnering and coordinating our various activities and programming has reached new levels and will continue to expand in the future, broadening the Society's appeal and visibility. The securing of PPE loans by David Chenu, our, our treasurer, made it possible to retain all of our staff, which was a rarity among other nonprofits during this period. We finally realized the completion of the long-term project by opening the Archive and Research Center, thanks to many of you here tonight. Special thanks to Carla and Tom Fortman, his gracious gift, and Michelle Socolo's gift from the state. <clears throat> and when I approached Michelle at the visit, opening of the Visitor Center, I had no idea that uh, she was really listening to me, but she came through. <laughs> When I asked for money, you know, some people when they ask for money, they kind of turn away, but uh, she was listening and with Carol's help, they, they got the grant together that, uh, that realized the money. Um, with that money, we're four-fifths of our goal, which is needed to finally realize the long-term desire of the society to turn this spot, the depot, into a wonderful exhibition center as a visitor's first experience with Lexington. We're looking forward to that when it's complete. I was honored to serve as president, but I need to give specific thanks to the staff and board members who supported me, my executive committee, and in many of the online votes we needed during my tenure. A special thanks to the search committee, Carolyn Brockett, Lester Savage, Liz Cokey, Rebecca Moore, Ann, Lou, Ann Lee, and our chairman, Craig Standler, for their professional and efficient work in selecting our new executive director. We hit a home run in Carol. <laughs> who, as many of you can see, <laughs> who, as many of you can see, has already projected the vision taking the society to the next level. And that was the, the main criteria we had on the search committee when we were, as our priority in selecting the right candidate for the job. Thank you also to my executive committee, Ann Lee, Dave Chenu, Donna Hooper, Mary Keenan, Rebecca Moore and Carol Ward for their support, guidance, and patience in dealing with the many issues of the society over these last two difficult years. Finally, I need to give a tremendous thanks to Ann Lee, your new incoming president. She is a bulldog in the, burst, in the best sense. <laughs> <clears throat> she is the epitome of a doer. We truly worked as a team, and without her support and energy, these two years would not have been as successful as they were. The society's in great hands, not only with Ann, but the entire elected in incoming leadership. Um, I look forward to many great things in the years to come, and thank you all for the honor to serve as your president. Um, 
Jerry, are you ready to give your award? Yeah, we are, we are Bill. It's long as we, we love technology and we got to suffer at it. Okay, do you, want me, do, you want me, do you want me to go on to something else first before I introduce you, or are you pretty much ready to go? You ready to go? Okay, Sue, did you want to, uh, want to, do, right now I'd like to do Sue Rockwell, and Sue, I'll let you take it from here. Okay. We'll get some of our uh, required business out of the way while we're uh, moving on here. Um, I think I'm doing the same thing that he was doing. <laughs> okay, we'll leave that up there, all right? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, so my first pleasant duty this evening is to talk about awards. The Lexington Historical Society, from its very inception, has relied primarily through the, through the efforts of its dedicated volunteers. We've functioned over the years only because of our volunteers. Beginning with a recommendation by George Gomoda back in 2008, we have annually honored all volunteers by honoring several uh, representative people who have uh, been outstanding examples over the past year or so. Now, this year, the last two years actually, we haven't given awards because we haven't had actual meetings. And we talked about awards for doing this year, but our volunteers have really been working behind the scenes. We really haven't been able to identify too many of them, so we thought, okay, we're only going to give two awards this year, Captain Parker Awards. I'd like to thank the committee, which is George Gomoda and Sean Osborne and myself. The Captain Parker Award is the highest honor given by our society. It recognizes extraordinary volunteerism over a sustained period of time in various areas of service for the society. So our first recipient, representing the year 2020, is someone that you have never seen before you with a gavel in his hand. He's never been an officer, but he's been on the board of directors for about 30 years. He has been active on our former membership committee and was chair of it for several years. He has been co-chair of our relinquished treasures sale, doing everything from lugging stuff from Donna Hooper's basement to cleaning and pricing items. He is currently serving on our collections committee. But those are kind of the more major things he's done, but he's done a lot of little things for example, you need a barbecue cooker and someone to cook the hamburgers and hot dogs. You need someone to drive our cranky 1911 fire engine. You need someone to craft a lovely centerpiece for a refreshment table. He's been our man. And these are only a few examples of his wonderful service to our society. He's contributed in so many, many ways. No surprise by now. The award goes to Charlie Vale. Representing the year 2021, we turn to a person who has also made her mark in ver mer many areas of the society. She has risen through the ranks to serve as president. I first met her many years ago when we volunteered at the old gift shop ticket desk when it was at the west end of Buckman Tavern. She has served in many capacities over the years and has been invaluable in our contacts with the town. 
She has been co-chair with Charlie of the Relinquished Treasures Sale for many years, enlisting many volunteers from the society and even a couple of other people, including her sisters. I can't think of any aspect of our work that she has not touched. Her wise counsel has been invaluable. She is currently the chair of our newly formed Fund Development Committee and an active and involved member of our Governance Committee. Yes, I'm talking about Donna Hooper. Relinquished Treasures Charlie, too. So thank you very much. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to nominations and elections. And once again, it was uh, George Komoda and Sean Osborne with me working all this out. The, um, the nominations and elections is a subcommittee under the governance committee. So technically it's the governance committee which is proposing the following slate of officers and directors for election this evening. Officers for a term of one year, President Ann Lee, first vice president, Craig Sandler, second vice president, Rebecca Moore, Clerk, Mary Keenan. Treasurer, David Chenu. Directors for the term of three years, ending at the annual meeting in 2025. Renewing members are Carol Ann Brockett, Lester E. Savage III, and Hua Wong. Joining them are retiring President Barry Kuna and new director, Nirja Bajaj. Nirja, are you here and did I pronounce that right? Oh. Okay, <laughs> it's being pronounced the way I'm pronouncing it then. <laughs> uh, Nerja is a senior director and product manager at Avaya Communications. She's co-president of the Indian Americans of Lexington and a volunteer for the Indian Circle for Caring USA, Inc. She's a co-founder of the Dancing Feet Club and is a member of Lexington's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. She's co-chair of the junior and senior LHS, Lexington um, High School, <laughs> parent group, a parent volunteer leader for the Boston Philharmonic Youth Organization, or Orchestra, and a member of the Friends of Lexington Music, Art, and Drama students. So this is the slate that we are offering this evening. Are there any nominations from the floor for any of the positions? Seeing none, I move that the clerk cast one ballot for the slate of officers and directors <coughs> as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I move by acclamation. That's the same thing, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone, anyone against, say nay. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. What I would like to do now is to introduce the officers and directors so you'll all see who they are, the ones who are here this evening. I would like to first introduce the following directors emeriti and previously elected and currently serving directors. And I'd like you to stand as I call your name and everyone hold your applause till the end, okay? Directors emeriti, Bill Mix, Richard Paget, myself, Paul Ross, Van C. Scholes, Thomas Taylor, Charles T. Vale, F. David Wells, Jr. Okay. For the term ending at the annual meeting 2023, Marsha Baker, Donna Hooper, Elizabeth Kochi, 
Edward McCarthy, Paul O'Shaughnessy, and Bill Poole. For the term ending at the annual meeting 2024, Veronica Kyra, Marion Cohen, Judith Crocker, George Komoda, Susan McClements, and Sean Osborne. And now the directors elected this evening, Nirja Bachaj, <laughs> Carol Ann Brockett, Barry Kuna, Lester E. Savage III, and Wa Wang. Our officers, Director, uh, Treasurer David Chenu, Secretary Clerk Mary Keenan, Second Vice President Rebecca Moore, First Vice President Craig Sandler, and President Ann Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, your governing board. So now, uh, we'll get, you ready? <laughs> okay. Okay, so it is my pleasure now to introduce Jerry Frank and Bill Erickson of Bechtel Frank Erickson Architects and Matt Bechtel to present the Bechtel Award for Excellence in Design in memory of Rick Bechtel. The Historical Society is honored to host this award presentation most years. <laughs> Can't say anything's annual anymore, right? Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm Jerry Frank, Bill, Matt Bechtel. Uh, thank you for being, hanging in there with us as we get, get the slideshow underway. I, the evening for us is all about several things. One is this is the, quite a important year for a number of reasons. One is it's been 10 years since Rick passed away. And uh, big thanks go to you folks, the Historical Society, because uh, when Bill and I have talked a lot about what we can do to honor Rick, uh, Lexington was so important to him. And I think the idea came from the Society to create a, an award that honored good design in the Lexington area. And it's been actually really a wonderful process for us. And I have to say that it means a lot to the recipients, it means a lot to us, and really couldn't have done it without you. So huge thank you. <laughs> so nice to have something positive that we can look at. And there is, if you look around, you know, we've honored in the past, as you know, landscape work, we've honored buildings of different sizes and shapes on it. And tonight is really great. And actually with the pause that we had during the past two years for COVID, uh, there's been a lot that's kind of come up and it actually made discussion, you know, quite animated as we gathered our jury together to talk about things that are going on in Lexington. Uh, we do want to invite you all is please nominate projects and we're going to, you know, our, our website will be up with nominations for next year and we really do want to encourage everyone in Lexington to really be part of it and nominate projects that you see and that you really like because it's such a pleasure to be able to share some good news, you know, from amidst all the other things that we have kind of rolling along. So, and if we're, how, are you, how are you working out there? Not so good. Not so good? Not so good. Yeah. Didn't, um, didn't come through. <laughs> so we apologize for the my graphics. Um, it's just, I was going to say, it is 10 years since we hmm? passed away, and it's 30 years since we started our firm. And I was going to say nobody could believe it, but our technical incompetence is proven. <laughs> <laughs>
had looked at the um, uh, at your own uh, addition to the Monroe Tavern. I can take this off. I'm going to see my grandchild on Saturday. My new grandchild. And my daughter is requesting our care. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, the number again? 1312. 1312, 13, 12. 13, 12. okay. Right. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and also we Let's felt like this was really going to be a design that would uh, you know, stand the test of time. It's, you know, it's not kind of like a cliche Done. like what well, was built in you know, there we go. the early 2020s and stuff. So thank you. That's really <laughs> I try. I try. One of us, yeah. <laughs> um, I still have a role in that, by the way. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that we uh, wanted to just touch base on is that this is a house located in the historic district, so it was under the review of the uh, HDC. And I think this is a great example of, um, you know, the, the sort of public oversight of design and, and sort of helping to create, uh, you know, Better design. I've, I've done a number of projects with the HTC, and uh, my nose will likely grow as I say what a pleasure it is. But uh, I do think having, you know, uh, as an architect, having your thoughts challenged, kind of, uh, you know, thinking about it. Um, I think that the, you know, you're not put in handcuffs, uh, but you are made to really kind of think things through. And I think um, I'm sure this was an experience for Sally as well. So. Without much more ado, I invite Sally Cobb to come on up. And Partners in crime here, Bob and Ann Eccles are here. But it, this project really did remind me of the book, The Team of Rivals. Where, <laughs> but it was a great conclusion where 
a spec, spec builder, yes, not, no, go on. And the, the HDC and the, um, their design, Bob helped out with us. So we all pitched in um, and I think it's just such a great honor that it was recognized as a wonderful project. So thank you very much. Sarah does deserve all the credit for this because she kind of tempered me at some of these meetings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the people she's speaking to have been really well for me. But um, dealing with the ECC was challenging. Yeah, Sally did, here. Sally did a great job with it. Thank you. Thanks. I have one more final duty, and uh, that's the passing of the gavel. So if everybody would give a big hand to our new incoming president, Ann Lee. appreciate it. I, I promise to use this sparingly, but if necessary, I will come down hard. But thank you all. Thank you to our board. Uh, thank you to our volunteers, our um, members, and all our community partners who are here tonight. Um, I hope you can all hear me in the back. So, okay, thank you. So, Barry, you're not done yet. Um, you, up you get. <laughs> I just want to say, first of all, I've been likened to a long-necked giraffe quite frequently, but never a bulldog. There you go. So that, um, that was definitely a first. But I wanted to thank Barry. Uh, he was definitely the pandemic president who basically spent his presidency looking at everyone, you know, as a little square, uh, you know, up on the computer screen. And that wasn't easy. Um, and he really steered the ship through two years of choppy, changeable waters. And his leadership uh, and his decision making helped us keep the staff. And um, as a group, we, I think, kept the high level and high standards of the society, kept our level of excellence, and pivoted in many ways um, to embrace new technologies and new ways of reaching out to the community. So as a show of appreciation, I have two gifts for Barry, because I'm an overachiever. Um, <laughs> And the first is uh, something for you to sip with. So that's your first thing. Or take a swig, I should put it that way. There you go. <laughs> and the second, which you have to open, um, this is for you to take a swing with. You'll get it. So, uh, yeah. She knows I'm a golfer. <laughs> 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 so these are custom made golf balls, uh, take a shot golf balls, and I hope to see them in the museum shop, and I expect them to be a sellout. So that's your swing. Great. So thank you. Thank you thank very you much. For all you did. So I look out and I know many of you and I look forward to getting to know the rest of you and working together to make the society even more exciting, uh, an even better place and a more engaging and welcoming place for people to come to. And I don't like talking about myself, you'll get to know that, but I will tell you a little bit about myself um, just so you get to know me a little better. And then I hope to meet many, many more of you in the weeks and months to come. 
So some of you know I was born in Switzerland, which explains my love of all things chocolate, first of all. And some will say um, makes me kind of a neutral person who can look at both sides of an issue, that kind of thing. Um, I also tell really cheesy jokes. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also very precise. So if anyone's had me editing something for them, they know that I'm like a Swiss watch. And I dot the I's and cross the T's. So um, I came to the US for college, went to school in New England, and then spent my career in the Boston area at the Museum of Fine Arts, at Vos Galleries in Boston, and at Historic New England, which then had the incredibly long name Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities. Um, then my husband and I moved to Lexington in 1995, and very quickly I joined the Historical Society. I think Les Savage was the one who first tapped me. And I've been involved ever since. So as a volunteer, as a committee member, as a board member, as a, an officer, and now here I am. So it's been <laughs> Thank you. So it's been 20 plus years, and I have to say it's a family affair. So you might have seen this already, but my oh, husband right. is a minute man, so you'll see him at tavern nights hanging on the bar. <laughs> and so that's my husband. My dog uh, made a cameo appearance <laughs> in a photo shoot, so that is Gavin. Then we have my son, my youngest, was a camp, um, joined the first shot summer camp, um, and then became a counselor, and also was known for playing Aunt Lydia in the <laughs> camper's play, and I promised I would not show that picture of him <laughs> in Aunt Lydia's outfit. So no surprise, he's the tallest one in all of these pictures. And finally, my oldest son is the one responsible for all those hysterically esoteric questions at tavern nights, I mean trivia nights, sorry. I've got that on the brain. So I'll leave this up for a second if you want to think about this one. This was an Ethan special. I'll get back to you on that one. Yeah, it, it, that was a good one. So that's our family, um, and that's been sort of a little sort of thumbnail of my involvement with the society. And as I look ahead uh, to the next couple years, I realize, yes, we've got a packed agenda, um, but there are two big projects that I'm especially looking forward to jumping in on. And the first um, is this space here. Uh, when I first joined the society, we had just purchased this building, which was, as many of you know, uh, a train depot um, built in 1846, my notes, 1846. Um, and if you can imagine, um, there was a women's waiting room, a gentleman's waiting room, it's all in this space, and then you walked out those doors to get on the train. And when we first purchased the building, the idea was to create office space, which we did. Um, but the dream and the plan down the road was to make it a flexible space for exhibitions, for community involvement, community activities and programs, and to really open the doors not 24 seven, but almost. Make it a very, very welcoming space. So I, for a long time we weren't sure we could do that, 
it was partly financial. Um, and then we had some very exciting developments, which I will let Carol speak to uh, when her time comes. That's the first big area. And the second is Revolution 250, which is a consortium of organizations and individuals that will explore the history of the revolution and look at how it resonates still today. And uh, events are already being organized and planned and it will all culminate in 2026. This is an opportunity for the society on so many levels and I think it's really exciting to think about. So just briefly, the first is yes, we will be celebrating the founding of our country, but we will also be exploring how this was not an easy process, that it's a process we're still struggling with, and how our understanding of freedom differs, and how do we make this relevant to people who might not have been born here, who might not speak our language, um, and you know, who might not have that same perspective that we do. So I see this as a really exciting way to use our knowledge and collections um, and exhibits to tell a story, but not just the story of one day in history. The second is we have an opportunity to build partnerships for preservation and for our collections to further preserve them and expand on them and share them with the public. There is a lot of aspects of our collection and our buildings that we have not really looked at and so we have an opportunity now to do that. Next, collaboration, which is something Carol's going to talk about uh, in her presentation. It's like, how do we connect with different groups in town? How do we tell our story in a way that's engaging, that's inclusive, and that brings together different people, both locally, statewide, nationally, internationally? And the last is that we have an opportunity to bring people here and really put Lexington on the map and in a really exciting, special, new way. So those are all the things I'm looking forward to working with the board, with volunteers, um, with community partners, and I hope you'll join me um, in doing that. So thank you. Um, if, did anybody come up with the answer to the trivia question? <laughs> No? Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Carol Ward, who joined us as executive director in September 2021, and a board member recently, you'd, you'd been here just like not that long, a couple months maybe, Someone said, oh yeah, you've been here a year, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just had to laugh because she's basically done in like, you know, two days what most people spend a year doing. So uh, we're really fortunate to have Carol. And she comes to us with 20 years experience. Um, she was director of One River School in Larchmont, New York. We won't hold that against her, uh, which is a for-profit school. And prior to that, she served for 10 years as executive director of the Morris Jamel Mansion um, in Washington Heights, uh, again, New York City. So her experience spans a huge range from programming, education, curatorial, um, development, fundraising, and all of those aspects and strengths we've already seen um, in the last few months that we've had her on board. 
So she's an out-of-the-box thinker. She's creative. Um, she's not afraid. And don't tell her no, because <laughs> just don't. Um, so Carol, thank you. And You've got the long and short of it now between Anne and me. Uh, and I'm not from Switzerland, so. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? I've got teacher voice, so I'm not used to using a mic. All right, well, thank you guys so much for inviting me. I know there's always a speaker at our annual meetings, and we are talking a lot about the future of the society, so I offered myself up for this, this talk. And I am very excited that the talk that I'm giving today is an abbreviated version of actually something that I'm going to give at the AAM conference in Boston at the end of May. A I see Rebecca in the background. <laughs> AAM, for those of you who don't know, is the American Alliance of Museums. It's the biggest conference museum shindig every year. And uh, to Anne's point, literally, I think it was the second day I was here, I went online and submitted my proposal and got accepted, so I'm excited. Um, so my talk today is Contemporary Meets Colonial, Building Community Through History. And I think, before I go to any other slide, this is really what attracted me to the job here at Lexington Historical Society. So I need to thank Barry for welcoming me as president. Um, First day I walked in, I was like, well, you didn't tell me what hours you want me to work. He's like, you figure it out, it'll be okay. I was like, oh, okay, that's like the <laughs> best job ever already. Um, <laughs> and the uh, search committee led by Craig just made me feel so, so welcome. I came up here on my final interview, and, and those of you who have met her already, my mom is basically my closest advisor, and we're driving back down to New York, and she's like, what do you think? I said, well, I was looking for three things. I was looking at the staff and were the staff dedicated and really passionate about their job. I was looking at the status of the houses because as we all know, running historic houses, there's always work to be done. And I was also looking at the board. And I think I have never met a more engaged and energized, excited board that aren't afraid to say, okay, this is what we've been doing for the last 100 years, but we're ready for change. And I think that's where my presentation starts today. So anytime I come into a new organization, I want to know what we are related to the community. And what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be connected to your community as a historic site? And we have multiple historic sites. It's hard enough marketing one house, but we've got four houses, including this one. We've got the Belfry, we've got all these amazing things. So this is what I want me to think about as executive director, the staff to think about, and all of you as our constituents and our ambassadors. So what is our community? And when I think about that, I don't think about my answers to these questions. I think about what is the community going to answer these questions as? So if we walked out onto the street right now and went down to Il Casale and said, okay, what do you think of when you hear Lexington Historical Society? What do you think of when you hear community? What do you think of when you hear the American Revolution? And what do you think of when we hear a historic house museum? All right, this is the interactive part of the program, folks. <laughs> so who can give me one word, good or bad, when you hear historical society? Don't be scared. I don't bite. I'm going to call on preservation. Preservation, excellent. All right. So we think of preservation when we hear historical society. What do we think of when we hear community? Collaboration. Excellent. Thank you from the back. Collaboration. Anyone that's answering will actually get an extra cookie. So just. <laughs> what do we think of when we hear American Revolution? Lexington. Lexington. <laughs> bias, Marsha. Bias. <laughs> and. <laughs> And now this is the tricky one, and I want one good and one potentially not good answer. 
What do we think of when we hear historic house museum? Give me a positive one first. Treasure. Treasure. I like that. Treasure. And what's one thing that maybe someone in not in this room might say, Rebecca? Okay, so I'm answering from like a 18 year old, 18 year old, maybe daughter, maybe son. Um, what do they think of? Boring. Right answer. Good job. <laughs> Boring, right? Because we are all in the business. We love historic houses, we love preservation, we love museums. You know, Sarah and I had the Felicity Dolls when we were growing up. I went to Colonial Williamsburg. We're all history dorks in this room. But how do we connect with people who don't live and breathe history and historic house museums? So this is kind of the big overarching conversation now amongst all museums. And historic houses are kind of a subset of that, right? So. A mission-based organization or institution versus a community-based organization. To give you an example, here in Lexington, the Monroe Center for the Arts is a community-based organization, right? They offer arts programming, they show contemporary artists from town, and they have a mission, but it's very centrally community-oriented. A museum like us, we're mission-based. We have a mission statement, we have a vision statement, that we as a 501c3 have to kind of abide by on a yearly basis. But that doesn't mean that there's this huge chasm between the two. Both of them can actually happen at the same time and they should happen at the same time. But that means as an organization and our members and our volunteers all have to kind of live and breathe these questions. What is our mission? What is our vision? Who is our community? And who is our audience? Now, full disclosure, to let you in on the secret, there's no magic bullet to any of these questions, right? If we do more tavern nights, we're not going to get everyone in town to come. If we do our slavery reinterpretation of Hancock Clark, we're not going to get everyone to come. But what Anne alluded to is we want to be, as, as Sean and I have been talking about, diversifying our portfolio. We want to make sure that we offer different things to different subsets of people. So that's what I think about. Okay, why should we do this, right? We could all be in this room, we can all do amazing lectures and book groups and reenactments, but why should we connect with the community? So first and foremost, and Anne also alluded to this, we need to be a resource for our community, right? We, and not solely because part of Hamilton was written at my last job, we need to leave a legacy behind, right? The historical society is much bigger than any of us in this room. So we need to know that the Historical Society is a resource for Lexington as a community. I would say Metro West, Boston, Tri-State area. I know, don't hold it against me that I go back to New York, but Eastern Seaboard and beyond, right? Nationally and internationally. So we need to become a resource for our general community and then building out circular from that. The next thing, reverse affinity groups. What do people need and want from us? This is something that will stay with me for my whole career. I was lucky enough to work at Morris Chamel, as Anne said, Manhattan's oldest house, Revolutionary War site, George Washington slept there, all the, all the check boxes. And the executive director of the Historic House Trust, which oversaw 23 properties around New York City, his name is Frank Vignone. He wrote this book um, that I helped with a little bit. Um, called The Anarchist's Guide to Historic Houses. It's scarier than it sounds, don't worry. And basically what it means is how do we make historic houses relevant? And he coined this phrase. What it basically means, and using the depot as an example, is okay, we can have programs in here, right? We had a lecture last Thursday, we have our tavern nights at Buckman, but let's flip it. What in the community could use this space so we get new audiences in the space. For example, literally this morning, I was walking around Mass Ave, pitching sponsorship for the gala to anyone that would listen to me, um, because I'm a firm capitalist and we need the money, right? Um, but I went into the new bookstore and I'm talking to them about sponsorship and they're like, yeah, I don't know, like we're, you know, we're a new bookstore, I don't know how much money we're gonna have for that. I was like, okay, no worries, like no pressure. And they're like, oh, you know what, we're having an a author talk. We don't want to hold it at the library. We can't hold it here, it's too small. 
do you ever rent out the depot? I said, well, yeah, I, I do actually. Um, and they're like, okay, and we looked on the website and it's, it's a little pricey. And I said, gotcha, no worries. I said, what if you and I work together on this? What if you come in at a level that you feel good about sponsorship and I'll give you a break on the rental from the depot for the author talk and we can pitch it as a partnership program. And they're like, oh, you would do that? I was like, yeah, why wouldn't I do that? No brainer, right? I get your audience into my space. Hopefully I can convince them to become members and you become a sponsor of my gala. Done, we shut on it. So that's the conversation, right? How can we help each other? Going to my next point, funding sources. As Anne said, I'm a, I'm a think outside the box type of girl. I will ask anyone basically anything. And so connecting with the community is gonna help us get new funding sources. What's the worst that someone can tell me? No, I could tell you stories of how Hamilton was written at Morris Jamel. I had an out of body experience and asked Lynn manuel if he wanted to write part of it at Morris Jamel and he said yes. One of the biggest exhibits that I've ever done, I cold emailed a gallery in New York City, said you don't know me, but would you work with me? They said yes. So ask, and that's the main thing about being part of the community too. If the community knows me and knows all of you as ambassadors, more likely they're gonna say yes. And then last but not least, take away the fear factor. Ann was saying, you know, there's people that didn't grow up here in Lexington, that are new to town, that are new to this country. Our houses tell a very specific story. We're, we're growing that story. And the example I give with this, going back to Morris Chamel for a second, is Morris Chamel was surrounded by a 90% Dominican populated area. 95% of those people were under the poverty line. How did I get them interested in coming to literally a big white house full of dead white people? It's hard, right? It's really hard. And so that's the thing, is figuring out how to create programming that touches different people's lives. Because at the end of the day, our museums tell stories. And we wanna make sure that our museums tell the stories of the most people that we can and connect with those people. You know, my background first and foremost is in museum education. Start them young. Get, them to get the kids interested in history and then they become Sarah and I. And they hopefully will then work in museums and carry on their tradition of loving museums. So I, I do this work wherever I go. So, you know, we've got the definition of community up there, but then here's the breakdown in 2019 of Lexington and we've had a lot of conversations about this at the marketing committee with Craig, is you know, the largest chunk of that pie is white and Caucasian people, but then we've got everyone else, right? And Asian is the second, and we go down from there. So how do we connect? And it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do a program about the history of China or the history of African-American experience. Those are great, but again, it's reaching out to other organizations in town like ABCL, CAL, and how do we help each other get the word out? So some of you have seen this. So something that I, I did right, a little bit right off the bat back in January is marketing is so important to everything that I'm talking about right now. And so we as a society hired a new marketing consultant and a new graphic designer um, and what I want to do always is honor the mission of where I'm working, honor the mission of Lexington Historical Society, but make it a little more contemporary, a little bit more accessible, right? And so this was an ad that we placed actually with Cal um, for one of their fundraisers. And it's, it's all the same information, right, that we always had on our website, that we put out to the public, but it's just a little cleaner and a little more contemporary. And it just gets kind of the vibe that we want. And we've got a currently unofficial tagline that we've coined of where history comes alive. So you'll see that starting to be in a lot of our, our marketing materials. A little clunky, but okay. Um, so I just wanted to share with everyone, these are our vision and mission statement. For those of you who, are, who don't know kind of the difference between these in museums, it's a little semantical. Pretty much every museum has a mission statement. 
its purpose, right? So on our 501c3 status, it says that our mission statement is to facilitate Lexington Historical Society's role as being a leading expert in all aspects of Lexington's history and a premier interpreter of the town's colonial and revolutionary war narrative while engaging the diverse Lexington and global community. Bam. The end part is the key part of that, right? We need to engage the diverse Lexington and global community. And that sometimes gets lost because we want to interpret it, we want to preserve it, right? But we really need to engage everyone. It's been kind of a new thing in museums. The vision statement is the higher level one, right? What do we aspire to? So the vision, similar, the vision of Lexington Historical Society is to be a premier interpreter of the events, it should be events, of April 1775 and the faithful steward of all of the town's history throughout time. And of that is the important part too, right? Yes, we're talking about April 1775, but to what Anne said earlier, we also want to think about the town's history throughout time. I forgot who it was that said it to me, but someone said, yesterday is history, right? So as the historical society, we want to talk about history throughout time. It could be what we're living through now with COVID. It could be Black Lives Matter. It can be the 1920s. It can be whatever we want it to be, and our exhibitions and our books and the themes that we present need to cover all of that history. And we're so much more, right? A couple people that we know up on here. So, you know, we have the ARC opening, we have family programming, we have our golf classic, which, by the way, that was like my first month here, and Barry and everyone that played in that golf classic are my heroes. It was the worst weather day ever. <laughs> And I turned to Sue and I, I said, everyone's playing. And they're like, she's like, yeah, they play golf. Okay. <laughs> and even more, right? So we've got our archivist Elizabeth with scholar Bob Bellinger on the left, instrumental with uh, many staff and many board hours and giving Sean a, a shout out with, with Sean helping as well with our new slavery reinterpretation of Hancock Clark, which press release is going out tomorrow. So amazingly exciting that the Lexington Historical Society is on the forefront of museums delving into the enslaved populations at these historic houses, which are hard conversations to have, but we need to be having them. All right, so just to give you a little rundown on what I've been doing on the last six months, um, to make us accessible to the community. First and foremost, new website. Um, if you've not checked out the new website yet, please, please go take a look. Um, our marketing consultant and our graphic designer um, completely overhauled the website. Again, slightly more contemporary, um, definitely more streamlined, definitely more user-friendly, and just so easy to navigate with events on there now, all great information, being more accessible. It was the first time um, that Buckman's been open for the winter, and we had people coming in. We had about 30 people each weekend coming in. Um, people were thanking our frontline staff of visitor service associates for being open because nothing else was open in town. Uh, planning ahead. It's the first time that the society back in, I think we, November, December, and Sarah and I sat down and we used big sticky notes and planned out the whole year of events. So now if you go to the new website, you will see every event that is planned for at least the next six months on that website. So if you want to plan out and buy tickets to Ghosts and Graves in October, you could do that today. And this way you can make sure that you know what's going on, the community knows, we could do more marketing that way, and everyone in this room, as I said, is an ambassador for the organization. Tell your friends. Fundraising. I am one of those crazy people that I like writing grants and I like fundraising. Um, so we have been doing a lot of fundraising. We've gotten a lot of grants, as Barry said already, for this, this project with Depot, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we've gotten really great corporate sponsors. We've gotten grants from Mass Cultural Council and Mass Humanity. So the ball is rolling, which is great. And sometimes even more important than fundraising is friend raising. So friend raising is, again, going out in the community. Who do you know? Craig was at a meeting with me the other day. He's like, I'm gonna go to my favorite local restaurant and ask them to sponsor the gala. Great, because he's friends with them and he knows. 
So it's all about those personal connections. These are just some examples of things that we've done and are coming up. So tavern nights have been huge. The last one that we had on Saturday was a murder mystery themed one. We had 60 people in Buckman Tavern having an amazing time. We are partnering with other local organizations. So we had uh, the trivia at Revolution Hall. Um, and then coming up actually this Thursday, we have our Taste for Chocolate fundraiser. So if you like chocolate like Ann does, there will be tons and tons of chocolate. Um, and our headliner is Trisha Perez Keneally from In at Hastings Park. Again, just I just asked her and she said yes. Um, and then big plug to our gala coming up in June. It's called All Jazzed Up, and it's gonna be a 1920s themed gala. And it's the first time that we're gonna have an annual gala. So now every June, the society will have a gala. And who doesn't love dressing in 1920s outfits? It will start here at the depot, and then we are gonna transport people in 1920s cars over to Hancock Clark. It will be a thoroughly fun time. Um, anyone that you speak to about my galas, it will be fun. Lots of, lots of fun liquor and, and hidden things going on. So what does this mean for the future? And this project is what I'm most excited about, so I'm glad that Annie is excited too, so we can tag team the excitement. So when I was here for my final interview, um, Craig and Ann and Barry are, are leading me up to here because I was gonna meet the staff in here, and they're talking about the depot and that the society has owned it for you know, about 20 years, and we use it for rentals. And I said, okay, but do you ever use it for exhibitions and events and education? And Craig almost had a heart attack. He's like, yes, we have, but we want to do more. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, and so I walked in here, and very rarely does an executive director get a blank space to play with. And so it is very, very exciting to think about what this space is going to become. Again, honoring the history of the society, but also how do we bring ourselves to the next level? We're literally in the center of town in this building. And we've got so many exciting things going on, as Ann said, Rev 250 is coming up. This will be the jewel, the showpiece of the society. And people will start their journey here. And it will be amazing. And it will be better than concrete, very promise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be writing the RFP, the request for proposals. Les has been amazingly helpful. The floor is already picked out, so we've got a floor. So that's, a, that's a good start, start. And as Barry said, we've been really lucky with fundraising. We're about four-fifths of the way that we want to go. And it's a space for education and exhibition, a space for rentals, and the centerpiece of the society. So how can, how can you guys help? You can help. As you all do already, you can donate your time, you can donate your expertise, obviously you can donate money too. Um, you can become an ambassador. You all are already, because you're sitting in this room tonight, and you know, it's dinner time and you could be doing something else, you could be watching Netflix, but you're here talking and mingling and learning about the next phases of the society. You can leave a legacy, like I said. We've just recently kind of launched our legacy circle and we're really happy that certain people sitting in this room have already joined, joined it. If you want more information, you can definitely ask me. And then fundraise and friend raise with me. I've got 22 plus bosses sitting in this room. I wanna be a partner with all of you to make the society as amazing as it can be. It's amazing already and we can take it to the next level together. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I guess I should lift this up again. <laughs> so now you see why we're so excited to have Carol on board. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you'll stay and mingle and introduce yourselves if I don't know you, um, and enjoy some more vittles and liquids in the back. And I guess I need to now ask for a motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. Second.
All in favor? Aye. And now the fun part. <laughs>